Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I thought I was first in line, and now I'm second in line. <laughs> but I still think that it's a great opportunity, especially because I'm hopefully going to give you a bit of a, a broader overview, the bigger picture of the concept of stewardship. And I hope to um, enrich the discussions later with a bit of a bigger picture um, as well. So I'm based at UKZN. I'm about to move on though. I'm about to register at Rhodes next year for a PhD. And this work is the early kind of exploratory work towards um, defining where I'm going with my PhD. And I've worked quite closely with a couple of practitioners in my work. I'm also with WWF and I just want to acknowledge them for their inputs into this work as well. So I'll be looking at two broad themes in my presentation. First of all, what does stewardship mean in theory? So what insights can we get from the literature on stewardship? And what does stewardship mean in practice? What insights can we get from stewardship practitioners? So having a little wade into the literature is quite frightening because there's a lot of different ways in which the term stewardship is used. And this is really narrowing it down into an environmental conservation kind of literature because there's all kinds of stewardship out there, like bacterial stewardship and all kinds of weird yeah. things. <laughs> so there's earth stewardship, there's stewardship of natural resources, environmental stewardship, ecosystem stewardship, biodiversity stewardship, catchment stewardship, corporate stewardship, land stewardship, water stewardship, the list goes on. So there's a lot going on out there, and um, it's quite tricky to try and narrow down what are the, the lessons learned that are shared across all these different um, conceptualizations of stewardship, and um, yeah, how can we learn from them? So the first thing I'm going to do is that we can look at the term stewardship itself. What does the term mean? So in theory, stewardship is actually an ethic. And it is also a metaphor for a very specific kind of human nature relationships. So human and nature relationships can be categorized and defined in many ways. And one of the ways in which we do that is through the use of the term stewardship. And in practice, amongst other understandings, it is a mechanism or tool for achieving conservation targets outside protected areas. So this um, meaning is probably the most um, commonly used one in our context at the moment. And it's also a mechanism or tool for promoting responsible land use and agricultural landscapes. So this is just a little snapshot of the way in which the word stewardship is used. And to further try and unpack where we've come from with the word, it's quite useful to have a look at a historical timeline. And just as a bit of a disclaimer to the timeline, this is a Western history. And I think it's important actually for us to recognize stewardship as an English word and its use is embedded in European and English and Western history. And that may in itself bring some limitations to how we use it in our work, especially that a lot of us are working in places where Western concepts and Western mindsets may not be relevant. So back in the 15th and 16th century, Man dominates over nature, that was the dominant way of, of seeing the man-nature relationship. And a steward was someone who took care of God's earth for, in order for man to flourish on earth. Then we moved on into the industrialization in the 19th century, where nature was commoditized and there was a managerial ethos. So a steward was someone who managed the natural resources in order to maximize profits and keep the machines of industrialization going. Then we moved on into 21st century, the rise of environmentalism, thank goodness. <laughs> Recognition of the interrelatedness of the whole, the, way, the fact that humans and nature um, are uh, interlinked and that humans are reliant on nature and that there was a lot of destruction of nature going on. So a steward became someone who protects the natural environment from the impacts of human activities. And now here we are in the modern literature. Um, the concept of stewardship has extended responsibility to also include future generations and other species. So it's not just for the benefits of people, but it's for the benefits of all the other species in nature that we need to be good stewards and for the future generations. And also shifting the responsibility just from land users to individuals who may not themselves be land users, but who may be having an indirect impact, and also to communities and also business. So a steward becomes someone who recognizes social ecological systems and the need to make these more resilient in the face of change. So the meaning of stewardship has changed over time and I believe it will probably continue to change. So this is one of the modern definitions of stewardship that you can find in the literature. Ecosystem stewardship is a strategy to respond to and to shape social ecological systems under conditions of uncertainty and change, to sustain the supply and opportunities for use of ecosystem services, to support human well-being. 
And here's another definition, one which I found a bit easier to work with and a bit more practical. Environmental stewardship is the responsible use of natural resources in a way that takes full and balanced account of the interests of society, future generations, other species, and private needs. And it also accepts significant answerability to society, and that's where the ethics comes in. So looking through the literature, there are a number of different themes in which stewardship um, is used. So water stewardship, biodiversity stewardship, land stewardship, ecosystem stewardship. And these different themes are implemented through various mechanisms. And these are just some examples of the mechanisms, stewardship mechanisms out there. So there's corporate stewardship. Many of you probably know about the Forest Stewardship Council, and there's the Alliance for Water Stewardship, and other big global corporate compacts around better land use, which is influenced through market mechanisms and, in effect, probably consumer demands for more sustainable practices. Then conservation agreements with the state, our biodiversity stewardship is a classic example of that. Land care in Australia has a similar model. Then agricultural stewardship schemes, which look just at ecosystem functions within agricultural production areas. And there's some good examples of these in Britain and in the EU and land care in Australia as well. And catchment stewardship. So this is about working with landowners collaboratively to minimize broad impacts of um, land use on water. So coming a little bit away from the theory and moving towards practice, um, I've had the great fortune of working with a number of stewardship practitioners and appreciate their time and input towards this quick summary. Quite a few of these um, people are also presenting their own talks, so I'm really just giving a snapshot to try and place some of the lessons from practice within the broader theoretical context as well. So my first case study is from WWF, um, the goal of which is responsible land use by farmers. It's, they're implementing a catchment stewardship and a corporate stewardship model with sugarcane and forestry farmers, where they're working with both private and communal landowners. The second case study is also WWF, it's about catchment stewardship, um, implemented through a biodiversity stewardship program. So the two are sort of working in parallel. They're working primarily with private landowners and the land uses there are mixed cultivation and grazing. And then the third case study is from Itagwini Municipality, where biodiversity stewardship is being implemented with communal land users in the Ingunyama Trust Board land areas. And there the, the land use is dominant, predominantly subsistence land use. So I tried to extract a few lessons from each of these case studies and the enablers and drivers. So what makes stewardship work? What makes it happen? Um, our WWF colleagues point out that committed individuals and champions are really important and that shifting big business priorities have also played a big role. So as I mentioned, for example, the Forest Stewardship Council, there's now pressure in the sugar industry for sustainable practice, which is coming from the sugar buyers. And th so these kind of changes which have come about as a result of good corporate governance are having impacts on the ground and are promoting stewardship amongst farmers. Then in the second case study, enablers and drivers, committed individuals and champions come out again. Institutional support seems very important. Um, suitable and effective incentives. Um, also these need to be um, tailored to the local situation, which I'm sure most of you who are working there know. And interpersonal relationships are really important. And from the third case study, wow, committed individuals and champions, again, there they are. We really do rely on them a lot, I think. Good leadership in the communities and also suitable incentives. Then looking a little bit more towards barriers, some of the problems. So in the WWF example with farmers, um, there's a perception out there that doing the right thing is costly. And in some cases it may be true, but I think there are also many opportunities where we can show that doing the right thing may not necessarily be costly and may save you in the long term. There's also a concern about the lack of institutional support around incentives. So where, for example, the market mechanisms are not paying a financial incentive to farmers as yet, they may not have the motivation to change their practices. In the second case study, um, some of the barriers, slow bureaucratic processes, institutional capacity, which is short or lacking, incompatible land use, which is where farmers want to do something else with their land and not conserve biodiversity, which I guess they're entitled to, Negative perceptions of the conservation agencies, of the NGOs, of the green agenda. <laughs> and the third case study, some of the barriers, complex governance arrangements, so where multiple um, authorities are in place and there are different um, priorities. And poor institutional alignment as a result of that, for example. And also expectations from communities that don't match the reality of what stewardship can actually offer. So just to quickly summarize these insights, 
champions are really important. And as I said, I think we do rely a lot on them and maybe we need to think about how best to actually make use of champions and maybe um, emphasize um, their role and also recognize their role. Institutions, and this is not just about institutions like organizations, but institutions also about laws and rules and how those can be um, better suited to what we're trying to do. Incentives, finding the right incentives. I think you all know that that's really a, a tough one. And just to highlight that these are all social processes, and I'm sure most of us here are natural specialists, and we need some social specialists to help us deal with these things. And I think there's also these issues that we've raised also of show that there truly is a gap between the theory and the, the visions of stewardship globally and what's happening on the ground, and we need to maybe think about how to bridge that gap. So that's where people like me come in. <laughs> I consider myself a pracademic in training. I'm not an academic. I'm not a practitioner. I'm a pracademic. Nice to meet you. And I'd like to see us pracademics playing a role in bridging the gap between theory and practice because it's a vast gap and there's a lot that we can learn in the space between the two. And having sat with some of my practitioner friends, um, we, I've tried to sort of give them a blank slate, give us some research questions. What do you guys need done? What can academics do for you? And we've got some ideas, incentives, methods for engaging landowners, possible strategies for trade-offs between production and conservation. So there's some ideas. But interestingly, I got the sense that content-driven research delivery, so here I am as a researcher, I deliver you my, my research product to help in your work, may not actually be what's needed foremost. Because each context is different, and even we heard about that in the Bush encroachment talk, local understanding of the local context is really important. And maybe in this context of stewardship, there's another role for academia. So for example, these are some of the ideas we brainstormed in our discussions. Maybe the academics can help in guiding reflection on practice. So all of you stewardship practitioners have to be very adaptive and learn by doing. But to be able to be adaptive and to learn, you have to reflect. Maybe that's the role that an, an academic or a pracademic can play. And also teasing out the lessons learned. So you're so busy out there ticking boxes, running around, measuring hectares, that you may not have time in the right um, facilitation to sit down and think about what are the lessons that you've learned. And also sharing the insights from the literature. So maybe there's a new role for academia in supporting stewardship. So in conclusion, uh, I hope to have given you a quick fly-by-night impression that stewardship is quite a broad concept used in many different ways. That there's a disjunction between what the theory says about stewardship and what's happening on the ground. And the case studies seem to indicate that some of the biggest issues, barriers, and potential solutions for improving stewardship are around social processes. And we need to think carefully about what role research and academia has in supporting stewardship. And it may actually go beyond delivering research content. And just in case you thought you were off the hook, I'm going to make you think a bit. <laughs> If you are a practitioner, I'd like you to think about what does stewardship practice have to offer the theory? If you're an academic or a theoretician, what does stewardship theory have to offer practice? And what if we could bring theory and practice of stewardship closer together for their mutual benefit? Wouldn't that be awesome? And then finally, how does your personal meaning of stewardship fit into the bigger picture of stewardship interpretations? I'd like to thank um, the co-authors, as I've mentioned. I'd also like to thank the farmers and communities. Um, I draw huge inspiration from working with people. And this guy who's falling off the edge of the slide there is one of them, Farmer Brown, I'll just call him for now. He's a real steward and a real champion. And it's, it's people like him who take responsibility for the land, who care deeply for the land and the, the nature, but who are also willing to work in a, in a process of change, having to adapt. Um, they really inspire me and make me realize that there is hope for us really implementing stewardship out there. I'd like to recognize the Saki Chair for funding. Prof. Mathieu Roger is my supervisor at UKZN.